All right, welcome everybody to this Stand Up Republic virtual town hall on, on racial injustice in America. Um, we're thrilled to, to uh, have your participation today and to welcome our, our guests. Um, I, I'm going to keep my remarks, I'm Evan McMullen, I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, very brief today, but just to say that, um, you know, this is a conversation that we're having with principled conservatives about the issue of racial injustice in America. Uh, a conversation that, that I think doesn't happen enough. It doesn't happen enough broadly in our country, but certainly not among uh, principled conservatives or conservatives at all. Um, and so while uh, we have this, uh, this discussion uh, that again, I think is, is too, uh, too infrequent, too rare, which is in part why we end up in, in the situation we're in today as a country, um, we welcome all to the, the conversation. And this is a town hall, so we're going to soon go to our, our guests and, and experts and our, our friends and colleagues, in fact, too, and hear, hear from them and hear their insights. But then we're going to hear your questions as well. And we look forward to that. And we welcome everyone to this discussion, whether you're also a principled conservative or an independent or, or a Democrat. Um, we at Stand Up Republic work to unite all around uh, our fundamental values, and and uh, we're certainly excited. Uh, and and I and I have to say I'm I'm optimistic that despite the challenges we face in this country, especially now, um, in these these challenging times, uh, there's great opportunity I think for us to recommit ourselves to our founding values as conservatives, as a country, hopefully the Republican Party as well, too, can make progress in that direction. Um, I firmly believe that our success as a country depends on our commitment um, to the fundamental truth and, and value that, that all are created equal. So with that, I want to, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks and yield to Mindy Finn before we go to our guests. Thanks, Evan, and thanks everybody for joining us here today for this really important conversation. As Evan said, you know, we started and founded Zen of Republic to unite Americans in a recommitment to these core values, liberty, equality, and truth. And you know, the, the value of equality is, is so critically uh, fundamental to, to our country, but it's one that we have fallen short of, short of meeting for fall too, far too long. And you know, we, I've, I've certainly, I'll just say personally, been heartened in this moment um, it's, it's really unfortunate that it took the injustice and the deaths of Black Americans at the hands of police to get to this point. Uh, but I've been heartened by voices that I don't typically see speak out on this issue. Um, many conservatives that, you know, it, it's not that their, their values have changed. This is something that they care about, but they're not often one to speak out. And at this moment, I see many more um, Americans generally and conservatives who are posting and saying, all right, like now is the time. Not only do I need to speak out, but I need to act out and I want to do something and, and we need to use this moment as a catalyst for change. I saw someone post today something that I thought um, you know, was, was simple, but really spoke to me, a friend posted, which is that you know, when the Black Lives Matter movement really rose up, you know, the kind of response to that was, by a lot of conservatives and others was, was all lives matter. And, and they were very much in that camp. And now they've come to realize that, um, yes, that of course all lives matter, but we can't have all lives matter unless black lives matter. Um, and I, I thought that was very compelling and something that I'm really holding in my heart as we move forward. In terms of the way forward, um, you know, I, I think part of it, the, the risk that we have in this moment is the risk that this will be like many other times when there is a new level of consciousness in the country tied to a current event or a series of current events, but then it wanes and everybody goes back to their lives and we don't actually use the moment to make progress. Um, I, I hope at this moment that everyone recognizes that there's an individual responsibility to act and we are able to be more productive and constructive going forward. In terms of how we do that, I'll humbly say, I, I certainly don't have all the answers and I don't, I don't think any of us do. However, I know a big part of the answer is listening and really listening to those who have experienced being black in America. Um, and that is, the, and also to transcend partisanship and to ensure that this is an issue that conservatives and Republicans and independents and, uh, you know, and, and Democrats and Republicans and people from all across the country really unite 
in, in having this conversation and acting and moving forward. And, and that we elevate for those who have personal experience. Um, it has been amazing to have this video you know, technology and everyone to have their phones so that we have the opportunity to see a lot of those voices elevated. And for this event, we wanted to elevate the voices of really friends, of, of longtime friends of Stand Up Republic and members. Tara Setmeyer, who is on, on the board of Stand Up Republic and has been um, a, you know, just a, a great friend and, and champion and advocate for these values and for conservatism and for, and for the country. Joe Pinion, who's our state leader from New York, and, and Sir Michael Singleton, who's a longtime friend who we've worked with as well. Um, thank you so much to the three of you for joining in this conversation. Um, I am going to turn it over to each of you now to speak um, and share some remarks. Before I do that, I'd like to say to all participants that get ready with your questions, because as soon as Sir Michael and Tara and Joe wrap up their remarks, we're going to turn to your questions. So what you may do, there's a chat on the bottom, so you can put your question in the chat, and please do share your, make sure your name is shared as well as where you're from, if you're willing, because when we take your questions, we, we'd like to sort of call out your first name and, and where you're from. So get your questions ready. You can start asking them now or ask them while our speakers are, are talking, um, and we'll be turning to you immediately when, when they're done. So first off, I'd like to turn to uh, Sir Michael Singleton. And Sir Michael, you can feel free to introduce yourself um, sure. the way that you like and, and go right into your remarks. Yeah, sure. So hi, guys. Thanks for having me, uh, Mindy and Evan. I, I appreciate it. As you guys have stated in your remarks, uh, this is obviously a very crucial and critical conversation uh, for us to have. It's one that we've had many times in our country, but I, I think uh, for some reason this moment appears to be a, a little different. And so my hope is, if it is different, we, we utilize it to actually create the type of change that so many people are advocating for. And I think for those of us on the right uh, who are conservative or at least center-right leaning, this is more critical because we are sort of in, 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 in the midst of the fight for our party, the fight for our values, to fight uh, to define what it means to be a conservative, to fight to live up to values consistently versus inconsistently. Uh, and so my name is Sher Michael Singleton. I'm a Republican uh, consultant. I've worked on three presidential campaigns, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, Mitt Romney, and Ben Carson. And I also do political commentary on MSNBC, and I'm a contributor to the Washington Examiner. So with that said, uh, just to just go into some of my remarks, you know, I, I've thought for quite some time now uh, about what's going on in our country. And obviously being an African-American male, these are things you sort of think about pretty often. These are things your parents, uh, once you become a certain age, uh, sort of talk to you about, particularly boys. I, I think I had more of these conversations with my stepdad uh, and my mom than my sister did uh, for, for obvious reasons. And so I, I think when you think about this paradigm, you think about where we are, and some people have asked, well, why is th this moment so different? Uh, and, and I think this moment is honestly different because you have a new generation of not just African Americans, but if you look at those who are peacefully protesting white Americans, Asian Americans of different orientations, uh, who sort of recognize uh, that we sort of live in a, a society where there are some inequities. And I think particularly younger individuals, more so than some of the older individuals, believe that we should live up to our highest ideals. And that means if we are going to live up to those highest ideals, there must be equity when we think about freedom, when we think about liberty, when we think about justice, uh, when we think about all of those things that we value and hold dear as Americans, you cannot hold those things dear if they only are for a certain sector of the population. And so I think when you see what happened to George Floyd, I think when you see what happened to Ahmaud Aubrey, which that case is actually going on currently, uh, people look at those instances and they ask themselves, well, are we really living up to the best standards of who we are? And if we're not, then isn't it time for those things to change? And I think that's why you see so many people who are saying enough is enough. No more broken promises. We don't want to hear that we're going to see incremental change we want change now, and I think, that's, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a beneficial thing. However, I think the question must be, uh, once the protesting is over, once the cameras go away, because at some point they will, uh, the hard work begins, the policy changes begin. 
And I think for those of us on the right, we must be challenged with asking ourselves, are we going to be a part of the forefront of, of creating the type of necessary policy changes that will then in turn enable us to go into the very communities that we've struggled so long uh, to target and to outreach and say, we understand, we get it. We have not been perfect for a long time. We haven't always gotten it right in a long time, but on this issue, this is a new chapter. This is a new page. And I think this is an opportunity to do that. Great. Thank you, Sir Michael. Tara? Thank you guys so much. I'm thrilled to be able to participate and have this conversation. Um, when you guys approached me about uh, the idea to do this, I thought it was fantastic because to Sher Michael's point, this conversation has not happened enough on the conservative side and to the point, almost to the point where it's, it's um, cast aside as some type of progressive uh, left-wing uh, idea that, uh, you know, it's all about race and identity and, and that that's not something that we want to acknowledge. And, you know, I have to say that I've, over the years, I've come to realize that, that, that there are things going on in this country that we can no longer ignore on the racial side. And we do have a lot of work to do. The, the times that we live in now have really illuminated some wounds that have, have been um, there for a long time that have been reopened. Um, certain elements of our society have been emboldened now to be uh, more vocal in, um, in the, the more uglier uh, aspects of our history. And I am alarmed by that. And I think many Americans should be alarmed by that. We've come so far and then we've taken many steps back in the last few years. And what's happened to George Floyd has united the country in a way that I have not seen in a long time. Um, you know, people keep comparing this to the 60s and, and I think there are some comparisons there. But what's sad about this, the comparisons is that the problems that plagued the, the, the black community and race relations in the 60s um, are back in the forefront. A lot of the problems, same problems exist. They have not been properly addressed uh, and it's bubbling up and we are seeing it. People are fed up. Uh, and it's, we have to listen. To Mindy's point, there hasn't been enough listening going on. And I come from a law enforcement family and my grandfather was captain of our town police department for 40 years, retired as a patrol captain. He was one of the first officers in that police department. I grew up in North Jersey. It's a very different environment than some other places. Um, but we were, I, I, I grew up behind that, that thin blue line and respecting that and that brotherhood. My husband is a law enforcement, federal law enforcement officer. He's black, um, I'm biracial. So I grew up in, in middle, uh, middle white America, middle class white America. And it was a very different experience for me than even my brothers here on the panel as black men in America. You know, I've had to have some serious conversations even with my husband asking him how he looks at this as a law enforcement officer and as a black man in America. He grew up in Brooklyn and in Washington, DC. So it's even been an, a kind of an evolution for me. It's been an awakening even for me as a conservative to see that enough is enough. We cannot sweep these things under the rug anymore and we've got to have honest conversations. And it starts like, it starts right here. And I think there's a certain responsibility that as conservatives, we as principled conservatives, where we are able to say, cast aside the more um, toxic political tribalism of these issues and start looking at the humanity of it. There's a problem in this country, racial injustice is real and we can no longer ignore it. And now's the time to start healing those wounds. And we're never going to be able to do that if we don't start having the conversations and then doing things to help change it. And so I'm happy to uh, be a part of this conversation and I, I look forward to answering the questions. Thank you, Tara. And a quick programming note, um, there's the chat and there's also the Q&A field. So feel free, I know people are putting questions in the chat. If you can going forward, we'll take them from there, but put them in the Q&A field going forward because you can like other people's questions and it's just a little bit easier to, to manage there. Uh, so now, um, last but certainly not least, I, I want to turn it over to, to Joe Pinion. Um, yeah, well, obviously, um, thank you guys so much for having me. 
for those who don't know, I am Joe Pinion, a uh, native New Yorker, born and raised in, in Yonkers, New York, uh, my hometown. Uh, you know, glad to always get together uh, with Stand Up and obviously uh, with, with Tara and, and, and Shermichael because I think that at the end of the day, um, you couldn't ask for a greater group of people to be associated with, so I'm just honored to be here. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think I've often said there is the um, kind of the human reality that we deal with um, and then the political reality. Um, I think that the human reality, the human tragedy of what happened to George Floyd is something that should be um, universal. Um, and the only thing that prevents it um, from being a universal truth um, are the political realities of the world in which we live. Um, because people feel as if they have to pick sides. Uh, they feel as if they cannot be in favor of black people. Um, and that means that they have to also be against law enforcement. They feel as if somehow um, that, you know, so that justice for black people is somehow incompatible with liberty for all Americans. Um, I think that at this moment, um, what could and should make this moment um, so abundantly clear and transformative um, is the notion that what happened to George Floyd is so unequivocally wrong. Um, the notion that a man could literally have his life um, eked out, squeezed away um, by a knee on his neck for nine minutes, um, it, it, it really is, is, is sobering um, for a great deal of people who truly just never really believe that such a thing could happen in the United States of America. Um, and so I think we can leverage that um, in service of a higher moral calling um, to be able to say that no, George Floyd should not have died, um, but that we could have a conversation um, rooted in understanding that if it could happen to him, um, that it could happen to so many other people um, and that we don't necessarily have to have these things happen again. Um, so I think, you know, for me as a black conservative, um, I think it's important to, to remind people that, look, I don't get to tell you what to believe. Um, but I do get to demand that you be consistent. Um, and so if you're somebody that believes that Colin Kaepernick should not have been kneeling because it disgraced the flag, um, the conversation that was brought up again today by Drew Brees in his latest interview, um, I don't get to tell you that that's wrong. I, I, I'm not the greatest fan of the protests myself. But the fact remains, if that has you up in arms, um, then you should certainly be apoplectic um, that somebody who has been entrusted um, to enforce the laws of this land um, they put their hand on a Bible um, to uphold the Constitution of the Republic for which the flag stands, um, was able to take another man's life in such a callous manner. Um, and that so many times things like this have happened and there has been zero accountability. Um, so I think we can start to hopefully have those conversations to get people to understand that their worldview is not incompatible with justice and liberty for all people, especially black people, when it comes to just demanding that we be treated fairly and equally um, in this place we call America, the land that we all love. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Those, uh, and also to Tara and Shermichael, those comments were, were very insightful as always from you and powerful and, and we appreciate them very much. There's so many great questions coming in and, and so I'm, I'm excited about uh, you know, the next part of this discussion uh, but I want uh, to pose one that, that it comes from uh, Sonia in, in Colorado, and, and I think it's sort of reflected by some other questions, which is a very simple one. You know, what can I do to bring change? And, and before, um, before I sort of ask you specifically that, you know, I'm seeing some other questions, another one from a mother saying, look, I've got two children. I'm worried that if I appear in one of these protests and there's violence and I get hurt, uh, that my, my family will suffer. So what can I do if I can't join a protest? But that's just a, just a broader question. What can people do? What can uh, anti-racism conservatives and Americans in general um, do to in this moment to make sure that we don't let this moment slip through our fingers without actually making some positive changes and reforms in the country? What can we do to actually make sure that in this moment um, we get the, the positive changes that we need. Tara, I'll direct that to you. You know, that's a question I get a lot, not just on this issue, but just because those of us who have been um, very vocal in our opposition to Donald Trump and what this country has kind of um, endured under his leadership, 
or lack thereof. Uh, people are always asking, what can we do? What can we do? Um, and in this instance, I think it, it, this is one of the times where paying attention to who is in your local leadership really, really matters. Because yes, there's a role for the federal government in all of this, but what impacts people every day more directly is local elections, local, uh, locally elected prosecutors, your sheriff, in some places where your sheriff is, is uh, elected, um, who your mayors are. These are the people that really impact the policies of your local police department. And, you know, those who, are, who may not feel compelled to go out there and protest, because that's not for everyone, and don't feel that you're any lesser than because you're not out there, you know, protesting. There are other ways, because the Buzz sure Michael said, the protest will end eventually. So then what's the next step? The next step is almost everywhere, there are elections happening this year um, at state, local, and federal levels. Make sure you are registered to vote. Make sure your neighbors are registered to vote. Make sure everyone in your family is registered to vote and pay attention to who are your local elected leaders. Are they representing your interests? If they are not, then vote them out. Find out who the other candidates are. Help get involved in a, in a campaign. It doesn't have to be a presidential campaign. It doesn't even have to be a congressional one. It could be your local um, supervisor of elections campaign. They have those. Uh, it could be your local county commissioner. Those are the people who make your, uh, the, the laws that affect you every single day. So that's how you can get most involved. Um, you can join groups like this one or others that, are, that you feel are, um, uh, that represent your interests. Seek them out. We have the internet now and a lot of us are home. So there's, you know, you can look into what can I do? What kind of organizations can I get involved in? You know, um, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of community policing, and I'll probably talk about that at another point in this. But see, where are there community-related issues with your police? Is it, uh, you know, cops programs, the police, policemen's athletic leagues? Make sure they're funded, things like that, to help with the community and rebuilding the rebuilding trust. So I think those are some examples of things that you can do right now, so that you don't feel helpless. Thank you, and and Tara, thank you very much for for those uh, those comments. That's sort of a general question, and we, we do, we do want to target as many of these questions to you as individuals so we can get as many questions in as possible. Um, but I recognize that this is such an important question. What do we do? What can we do? Um, so, Joe, I want to give you, you an opportunity, too, to, to add to that if, if there's something you wanted to mention. And yeah, I mean, just, just quickly, I mean, I'll just simply say that, um, you know, the, the old saying goes that decisions are made by those who show up. Um, but I believe the fine print to that is that um, sometimes people will have to be invited into the room. Um, and so I think that the easiest thing for many people to do um, is to figure out what their sphere of influence is, right? There were many people um, who were not of color um, who did not have to necessarily boycott um, the buses in Montgomery. Um, there were people who drove cars that helped people get to and from work um, because they didn't want people to have to walk quite as far. Um, in the midst of that boycott. There were people um, who were not walking around wearing I am a man placards um, in Memphis, Tennessee, um, but most assuredly there were people that helped pay for those placards and helped make um, those placards who were not necessarily black men um, in Memphis. So I think you can always find ways to lend a helping hand um, to causes you believe in. Um, perhaps today you're not making that I am a man placard, but perhaps you're helping to uh, stuff envelopes for a campaign for somebody running for city council um, that you truly believe understands the issues um, that you believe in. Um, because if you've lived in the town for eight years and the judges are all the same and the city council is comprised of the same people, um, then surely they've had all the time they've needed um, to address these issues. So perhaps a wholesale reboot uh, might be required. Um, so I think that's important. Find your, your sphere of influence. If you're a person who works in television or radio and you're getting ready to do segments on people of color and there are no people of color in the room to talk about what aspects of that struggle you're going to talk about, then perhaps maybe take it upon yourself to make sure that that room is more inclusive. Um, whatever your field may be, whatever your sphere of influence may be, um, whether it's you know, at the bingo hall um, or again, at your place of business, um, make sure that again, you're doing what's in your power. Um, again, to use the tools at your disposal to, to help in whatever way you see fit. Thank you, Joe. And sure, Michael, I want to give you a chance too. I know, I mean, I, I think um, Joe and Tara made uh, two very cogent points. I mean, I think Tara speaking about 
um, the, the politics of this, right? And, and making sure we focus on mayors and city council and city managers, because the mayor and the, and the city manager, those are the individuals that select a police chief, right? And so those are the, and when you think about a, a city council, that's the council that essentially, when they do the collective bargaining, with police unions, which I would argue are probably the most powerful unions remaining in our country. And so when you think about these policing issues, that's the political route. Now, Joe was speaking about, uh, I guess, more of a racial route. If you're white, perhaps bring an African-American friend with you uh, to some of those town hall meetings. When you're going to vote, ask your African-American co-workers, are you guys voting? Are you aware of some of the policy issues that are going on right now? Uh, because some of these issues may impact you disproportionately in comparison to myself. And so those are two things I think if you merge the two together, you, you can see some real serious change. I and mean, I think one of the issues that a lot of people have been bringing up recently is qualified immunity. Having the ability to sue uh, police officers, having the ability to have some level of transparency where we know if a police officer has had 17, in the case of the George Floyd case, 17 infractions against them, People should know why is this individual still on the force? Why haven't this individual been fired? Or if someone comes from a different city or a different state with those infractions, we should have the ability to know uh, that those individuals are potentially being considered to be hired on, on our force. And so, but the only way you see those types of things is if one, you're involved in the political process, and then two, if you're electing individuals who care about those issues. And I think that I think those two things go hand in hand. One, if you're going to go bring an African-American friend with you, make sure that they're aware of the issues because perhaps they're not as aware or as engaged in a political process uh, as, as you may be or as they should be. And so I, I think you look at those, the culmination of those things, I think that's how you can see real serious policy changes that will be beneficial to all people because the, the reality is if you hire good people, meaning law enforcement, you elect good people to hire those good individuals. I think you have a community that's all around safer if you're African American. If you're a Caucasian American, you feel a sense of comfort in knowing, you know what, other people who may not look like me are happy and proud about living in the community. They don't feel threatened, they don't feel safe because who would want to, to live in, in that type of existence on a, on a daily basis? And so when I think about those things from a policy perspective, I try to think about ways in terms of how people can see benefits, not just for themselves, but also for people in communities that may not necessarily look like them, that may not necessarily have some of the same things in, in common with them, but we have one thing in common, and that is we're Americans, we have liberties, we have freedoms, and we have justice, and those things have to always be equitable. Thank you, Shamichael, that's great. So, Sir Michael, I want to stick with you for, for a minute, and I kind of have a, a two for question that comes mm -hmm. from several questions we've been getting. Uh, so, first of all, um, a few people have asked, and I'll ask them kind of together, you know, what does it mean to be principled to you, and like, how, how does that relate to, to equality, uh, first of all? But, but second of all, Christian, who um, is the son of Nigerian immigrants, he happens to also be an intern with Standard Republic and a leader of um, American University Students for Biden. Um, he's active, he, he calls himself a Rockefeller Republican. He's wondering how kind of the Republican Party can get back to its um, to its its roots of desegregation and, and away from the Southern strategy, and and so as much as I heard Sarah, Tara say she's never seen the country more unified, and I, I tend to agree. And, and Shermichael, you hit some of those points too, but the fact of the matter is that you know there are still segments of our country who are not where we are on this. There are certainly segments of the Republican Party. Uh, Candace Owens, who's someone I know you've kind of <laughs> dialogued with, I think recently, <laughs> has a video that's gone incredibly viral today where she states, I do not support George Floyd and I'm not going to allow him to be a martyr. Um, so you know, those, those are two really big questions. One, what does it mean to be principled? A and two, how do we convince other, if we can't change the whole you know, Republican Party or conservative movement, how do we um, bring more conservatives and Republicans into the fold to, to truly embrace equality and to recognize racial injustice? I mean, so the answer to the first part, I mean, being principal, what does that mean to me? That To me, it means that I, I understand and I recognize that the society we have will be no more, no less than what we make it, no more, no less uh, than our willingness to, to stand up and speak up for what is right and stand up and speak out against what is just wrong. 
And I think it's as simple as that. When you know an injustice is occurring, when you know that there is an environment that is fostering that is uh, disparate from every value that we purport to believe, you have a moral and you have an ethical obligation uh, to say something. Uh, I always ask people, just imagine if, if, if it, the injustice was against you. Just imagine if the unfairness was against you. You too would want someone to speak up and stand out on, on your behalf. And I think it's as simple as that. Uh, as it relates to the Republican Party, I, I mean, I, I think as demography continues to change, uh, the party is going to either go one or two ways. Either we are going to be forced to reconcile with that demographic change and realize that we have to do a far better job uh, reaching out to communities of color, or the party will go the way of the Whigs and out of that will will rebirth into something new. And I don't know what that something new is. Uh, but, but I think what's interesting about this moment with, with Donald Trump is that he was someone who was able to win without really expanding beyond a certain percent. And my greatest concern with his victory was that you would have a certain percent of leadership in the Republican Party who would say, well, perhaps we don't really need to reach out to those diverse communities because we won the White House without them. And I think that is a terrible uh, miscalculation on, on their behalf. And the beautiful thing about what you and Evan are trying to do is that you recognize not just this moment, but you're thinking about what comes next, the five year, the 10 year, the 15 years, and how can we be competitive uh, against the other party? And I think a part of being competitive is recognizing some of the differences uh, in communities, uh, recognizing the disparities in, in, in some of those communities, and how do we uh, approach that with our values of liberty, uh, our values of entrepreneurship, uh, our values of, of family values and morality and ethics and hard work? How do we approach those things to the issues of various communities to assist them with reaching the American dream? And I think we can do that. We've done it before to the point uh, of the individual said that they're a Rockefeller Republican. If you look to the 1920s and 1930s, the early 1900s, an overwhelming majority, an overwhelming majority of African Americans voted Republican. Why? Because the Republican Party really sort of shepherded its values to meet the needs and demands of the African American community. We no longer do that anymore, Mindy. And so I, I think if we can get back to, to that, not just for Black people, but for Hispanic people, uh, for also some poor whites, where I would argue, if you look at the three groups, we have far more in common uh, than, than what you would be believed by looking at television or certain right-wing outlets. And so I think if we get back to, into that approach, back on that marker, then I do think you can begin to see real systemic change, not only within the party, but real progress with our ability to target uh, the communities that we, without a doubt, will absolutely need in the near future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sir Michael. Um, you know, the, the next question, I think that's a good uh, setup for the next question, actually, which, Joe, I'm, I'm going to direct this to you. I, I think it's, it's a tough question, and, and, and it's why I want to bring it into the discussion. And it, it comes from, from John, and John doesn't say where he's from, uh, but, but it is from John. He asks, you know, how do you, he says you, I think speaking to our guests, but I, as an anti-racism conservative, feel that he's posing this to me as well. He says, how do you reconcile your party affiliation with the party's attempt to suppress black votes? And, um, you know, I, I would sort of broaden that to say, you know, you know, there's affiliation of the party and then there's affiliation with the conservative movement. But it, it's, a, it's a question that I think a lot of Americans have. OK, so you're you know, African-American or you're a white American and you're anti-racist. You know, what are you doing associating with, uh, a, you know, a, a Republican Party or a conservative movement that is uh, has is so divorced from the fundamental value that we're here talking about today? Joe? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think, I mean, and, and to that point, I mean, I could tell you a hundred percent. I've gotten no less than fifteen calls um, in this past week um, from fellow Republicans, uh, Black people, um, who have you know, I've had to talk off the leads because they're like, I can't do this anymore, right? Like this is just this the timing, everything. I, I just I, I just don't know how to reconcile the two, um, and so it, it's a difficult. Uh, balancing act. Um, but for me, um, you know, I've always found my North Star um, to be ironically the founding ethos of the Black Congressional Caucus, um, the first body 
of elected African-American officials um, this, who got together to figure out how to leverage power. Um, and the ethos was quite simple, is that the black people have no permanent friends um, and no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Um, and I believe that somewhere along the way, we've lost sight of that true aim. And so as a result, um, people of color have made Democrats their permanent friend. Um, they've made the Republican Party their permanent uh, enemy. Um, and our permanent interests have been pushed to the side um, because politics used to dictate that if you solved people's problems, um, they would reward you with their vote. Um, and somewhere along the way, politicians figured out um, that if you didn't solve people's problems, if you left the problems unsolved, um, you could use those unsolved problems as a wedge to keep people divided and to win elections. Um, and so to me, I think when you broaden that out, um, not just the people of color, but I think Americans as a whole, um, that you have people who are, you know, died in the wool, you know, Republicans, um, they will be Republicans no matter what, even though you can ask them, you know, why are you Republican? And they can't tell you. Um, you can have people who tell you that they are, they'll be voting Democrat no matter what. Um, and if you try to challenge them on some of their positions, they have no answers. Um, so I think, again, many people, not just black people, have made permanent friends of uh, respective political parties. And the interests that we have that are shared um, have been pushed aside because people can't even realize that many of the things that we're talking about we're in strict agreement with. Um, so I, I think that is the issue. Um, again, you know, I, I always reference something as, as basic as school choice. And I say, well, look, if, if Republicans are consistently telling uh, America that black children are trapped I mean, failing schools because of the color of their skin and the zip code in which they live, um, and yet at the same time, when black people describe um, that system of failure as systemic racism, Republicans tell them systemic racism is not a real thing, how is it that we can understand that the two people are describing the same thing using different, uh, different words and different, different subtexts? And so I think that that is to me the type of challenge that we face today, that we have a love language disconnect um, in our politics, um, in our cultures, and that if we can get people to understand that there is more than unites us than divides us, that if we can get people to understand that as I understood concretely that perhaps there may be a day when I'm no longer Republican. Perhaps there may be a day where you should no longer be a Democrat. Um, but again, that we should not be permanently aligned with any party. We should be permanently aligned with our principles. I think that goes back to the previous question about what does it mean to be principled, it means that I have an allegiance to the principles before I have an allegiance um, to the party. Um, and specifically with racism, you know, for me as a person of color in America, understanding that politics um, is a vehicle. Right? It's not a party. I'm, I'm here to leverage power. I'm not here for the open bar. Um, and so I think if you look at it from that perspective, um, it makes it a lot easier uh, for people to understand and, and, and to make um, informed decisions about how they choose to align themselves uh, politically. Can I just say something really quick to add to that? No, yeah, please. Just so, so a lot of people, I've, sure, Michael and I have had this conversation. We've talked each other off the ledge many times. Um, and I've struggled with this for the last four years since Donald Trump won the election. And uh, our good friend Michael Steele has um, talked me off the ledge a couple times as well. And what Michael Steele has said, and I agree with everything Joe Pinion said in that respect, um, he's right on. Um, but Michael Steele makes a very simple point. He said, like, look, we, this is our party and we have, you know, there, it's flawed, may it be, but there are certain things that we have certain interests that we think are pro solve problem solving are better through Republican um, political channels and our principles as conservatives have a home there. But here's in our house, Trumpism has come in and he's been a terrible dinner guest and we're not going to let this person run us out of our own house. So we're going to fight and defend it until it's not possible anymore. And I kind of felt like, okay, that, that may be true. So why do some of us stay? Because at, when, when the rubble settles, who's gonna be there to rebuild it? We need to have two functional parties, healthy parties in this country um, because of the way our system is set up for right now. Well, is a third party a possibility in the future? Perhaps, and maybe the Republican party is beyond being saved. I can tell you that after this year's election, if Donald Trump wins again, I will disassociate from the Republican party without question, because it will tell me that it's lost. It'll go the way of the wigs, as, as Sher Michael says, something I say all the time. 
But I think that there's still an opportunity for those principles that we believe in to be to be um, to still still have a, a, a political home somewhere if we can get Trumpism out of here. But until that time, um, we, we still, it's a struggle. I just want people to know that. And the party has got to uh, recognize, I mean, a shameless plug, I wrote a piece, co-authored a piece with a, a fellow Lincoln Project advisor, a friend of mine, Nate Nesbitt. We wrote a piece about, it's time for the GOP to stop pandering to racism um, on CNN.com because that pandering that came out of the Southern strategy in the 60s has irreparably harmed the party for decades with the black community, for decades. So what, you know, if we continue to do that and just not acknowledge it and you just wanna whitewash that history, you're gonna have a difficulty branching out and trying to expand the party because the way it is now, it will not survive, it's not sustainable. So you have to acknowledge that and root that out, enough is enough. Um, and then maybe when once people realize that we can acknowledge that, then we can possibly move forward and make sure that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to hop in here, I know we're trying to move along, but I, I think it's an important point. You know, for me, you know, the reality is that racism is, has always been here. Um, and to me, when I look at politics, I say that, you know, there is a revolving door between both major parties and racism simply goes where it can find the most oxygen. Right. And so I think to me, it's important for us to understand this, right, that we don't lay our burdens down at the feet of Donald Trump um, the same way that we shouldn't, you know, put a black square on Instagram um, and think that everything will be fixed the same way we can't go out of our house, run 2.23 miles in the name of Ahmaud Arbery um, and then go to bed and sleep well at night, um, that there is work that is required. Um, the problem isn't that racism still exists. The problem is that what used to be a half-life for racism, meaning that what we experienced before we would never experience again, seems to now be having these flare-ups, right? As we have these advancements in the 21st century world where a person who harbors racist views in o Oregon can communicate with somebody who harbors racist views in New York who might be on the fringe about whether this is a pathway that they should take, you know, now there is a, a potential now for these things to start becoming more normal. And so I think it's the normalization of things that used to be um, put in quiet rooms that we don't talk about um, that would be the issue. And I think we have to confront that because I think racism in our politics will inevitably go away the day that pandering to racists can no longer win you elections. Um, and so I think on that perspective, as long as, again, we can be very conscious and very diligent and, and, and specific in our efforts to make sure that we don't have a resurrection, that that half-life doesn't actually turn into a new life for racism, I think then we'll be in a really good place to have the type of conservative movement in the future that we all want. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so, Tara, I want to I wanna turn this to you. And... This may end up being our last question. We'll see. We may have time for one more. Uh, so I'll try to combine a lot of people's questions. But essentially, uh, you know, the Republican Party, at least when it, it said it wanted to, to reach out to, to Black Americans and Black Republicans, and obviously it still says that, um, to, to kind of say they care and to do outreach. And, you know, I'm sure I've been part of these conversations you have. And really the piece that's often been missing is that it's not just the messaging. It's not saying you care. It's showing it. Uh, and a lot, we're having a lot of questions about what specifically can be done. Like, what are the policies? There's this eight is enough, I think, is the, the movement right now of policies for, um, for curbing police brutality. You know, are, is, is that the answer? What are your views on that? What are other things that actually can be done to, to show um, that the, the party stands for equality and not just not just say it. Well, I I can't purport to tell the party in its current form what to do because it's I feel that it's lost, uh, it's lost its way. But if if the sane folks were in charge right now, I my suggestion would be the things that we have we have to meet people where they are. You know, Jack Kemp was someone who was very influential in my. Um, conservative maturation in the 90s and watching how Jack Kemp when he was uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under George H.W. Bush how he operated in with action he was in the black community he was doing the work in person establishing relationships showing not just talking about what the, our policies could do 
um, to, to better the lives of, of, of people of color, especially in urban, urban neighborhoods, whether it was the opportunity zones, whether it was focusing on wealth creation, ownership, he would call it ladders of opportunity because you're never going to be able to guarantee, guarantee outcomes, but you need to create opportunities for people and give them the la those ladders of opportunity so they can take advantage of everything that's wonderful about this country, things that were denied syst systemically to people of color for decades in this country. Um, you have to make up for that. So the idea of what can we do, what kind of policies, there has to be, you know, re the Republicans not only, they can't just talk about it, they have to be there. You can't just show up six weeks before an election, going to a church fish, fish fry and say, hey, vote for us. Don't vote for those Democrats because, you know, we're the ones, we're the party of Lincoln. We freed the slaves and we helped pass the Civil Rights Act. People are like, how does that help? How does that help us every single day? It doesn't. So I think it starts with um, meeting people where they are, whether it's with, to Joe's point about school vouchers or school choice programs. Um, education is a huge issue where there was a lot of bipartisan consensus um, and because it starts there, you know, if these kids, if you don't have a decent education, you're not gonna, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for you. And that, so that's an area. Criminal justice reform is an area of bipartisanship. You know, the, the, the tribalism that we're living in now hasn't really allowed for us to have real conversations about this. Yes, we got the First Step Act passed, but there's more work to be done there. And I don't know if that was necessarily um, because of long-term, the, the desire for long-term changes there, or if that was just a, something that Trump saw as a political win, but regardless, you got it. Um, those are some policies where we're looking at this mass incarceration stuff and low level, you know, incar incarceration of people for low level drug offenses. Is that really the way to go? Um, those are the like, these are things that I think that people can see where we can make a real change with them. But you have to acknowledge what's going on first, how you approach it really makes a difference. And it's the same thing with what we're dealing with now when it comes to policing and the inequities in the criminal justice system and policing in neighborhoods. If you don't acknowledge that there's a problem, you know, you mentioned Candace Owens earlier and she, that, that video, I watched it and I, you know, um, you have to have some empathy about what's happening. Could you throw out a bunch of statistics and say, well, you know, not as many black people die at the hands of police compared to white people. So this is a fake thing. This is made up. Tell that to the people who are terrorized in their communities by poor policing or his systemic institutional racism that's gone on there for years and years. You have to demonstrate you have empathy in that and recognize it. There's a reason the Department of Justice has consent decrees in over a dozen police departments across this country. There's a reason why people, there are uh, citizen review boards that are set up in certain towns, in certain cities, so that there is civilian accountability immediately and input immediately in police departments where there are problems in the community. There's a reason why you have a focus on community policing that's successful in places like New Haven, Connecticut, where beat cops have to walk the beat literally for a year or two before they can get in a patrol car so they can establish relationships with the people that they are cho they are charged with protecting and serving. These are all things that we need to acknowledge so that that policies can in fact be put in place that affect people every day. And until you have that level of empathy and until you listen and you can see that, you're never gonna get anywhere. So I think that's where it starts. Those are some of the policies that we need to take a look at uh, and stop looking at them as this party or that party, but look at the interests of the people that they're serving and how does how do we come together on that? Great, thank you, thank you, Tara. Sure, Michael, I, I think we have one, uh, we have time for one more question and, and I'd like to direct it to you. You know, Tara and, and you and Joe have mentioned certain reforms and, and policies that would uh, help improve policing, whether it's community policing, we talked about, um, we, you know, we, we talked about some, some other issues, whether it's schooling, we talked about um, uh, reform in our criminal justice system. You know, there's, there's discussion now about ending qualified immunity. There's all of that. Um, all of that, is, you know, it strikes me as necessary and, and helpful and things that we should fight for on the policy front. But I think there's something deeper here, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. You know, before we can find success with any of that, we have to change, it seems to me, hearts. Uh, 
-hmm. and, and I think that's happening now. I think more and more people are aware of the challenges we're facing with regard to racial injustice in America. But I still think there's probably a long way to go, actually, uh, especially on the conservative side within the Republican Party. How do we do that? How do we, how do we, you know, how do we change hearts? How do we win hearts over in, in this effort? I mean, Evan, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I think from Dr. King uh, has tried to answer that question. Uh, W.B. Du Bois has tried to answer that question. Frederick Douglass have tried to answer that question. And unfortunately, none of them, they were, none of them were able to come up with an answer. Um, I think you can only legislate so much as it relates to, to, to race. You can try to make sure that legally you protect certain groups of people. You can legally say that we are not going to allow businesses or, or commerce, for example, to discriminate uh, based upon race and, and other metrics. Uh, but as far as how people feel, you, you can't, politics can't solve that, Evan. And, and maybe that's an answer that people would want to hear, but I, but I don't think politics can solve that. I, I, think, I think that's where you look to civil society. I think that's where you look to the churches. Um, I think that's where you look to community leaders and, and organizations to bring people together. I mean, Dr. King was famous uh, for one of his famous quotes was that one of the most segregated places or times in America was on Sunday at the church, uh, where you would see only black people going to a black church and white people would only go to a white church. And those are things that I would argue uh, requires introspection. I think those are things that require individuals to look and realize that, wow, I'm, I'm in a bubble. I, I, I don't really interact with people that don't look like me. Uh, and, 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 and take that self-realization to say, I'm going to take this next step forward to wanting to change that for me as an individual. I think perhaps through policy, you can encourage that. But I don't think you can mandate that, Evan. And, 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 and so that's why I think, and I, I saw one comment and some person said that racism will probably always be a part of, of our country. And I believe that to be true. I, I do. But I do think that as you see with new, newer generations, for example, Gen Zs, you look at data from like Pew Research, for example, they are far more aware of racial injustices than previous generations. Why is that? Because they're more, more likely to have friends who are diverse. So again, that goes back to, you can't legislate that. That's sort of something that's organic. People being around different people of different cultures. And I don't think it's problematic to say that I see race. I think it's problematic to say you see race and you're going to discriminate against someone primarily because of that race. But to see race as a recognition that I see you as being different. And that difference, that uniqueness is something that I'm interested in. I'm black, you're white. I'm curious about your culture. How do you guys do things? Why do you guys view things a little differently than how I may view things in my community? That's an opportunity to learn. And through that learning process, Evan, I think that's how people grow. I think that's how people change through those experiences. But I'm just not confident or certain that you can legislate that. You can encourage it, but I don't think you can legally mandate it. Well, certainly not, uh, and, and I agree with you. I don't. I don't think it's uh, you know something that's going to be solved in the halls of Congress. But I think it's incumbent upon all of us as individuals, um, drawing on your comments, Sir Michael, and and on on Joe's point about our spheres of influence. Um, that you know, some people are asking questions that sort of uh, suggest that they feel almost helpless. So what can I do to to make a change? Um, but I think it's the little things, you know, in, in life. It's the little small conversations we have with our neighbors and our friends where, you know, there's an opportunity to, to maybe change the, 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 in maybe the slightest little direction, the way someone thinks about an issue or to propose, you know, a, a little more empathy or, or sympathy on, on a point or um, to, to demonstrate a, a greater commitment to equality. I, I think it's, I think your point is right. We can't legislate that. Of course, we can't force it. We don't want to. Um, but it, within our sphere of influence, I think we all have tremendous power. And some of our spheres are small and some are large. But even I think the smallest spheres are sometimes the most effective and authentic. And there's great opportunity there. So I, I think we've, we've run out of time. I, you know, I just want to, to I'll, I'll make those sort of my, my parting comments. But uh, just in addition to those, I, I just want to thank our, our guests today, Sir Michael, Joe, and Tara for joining us. Um, you're all uh, great friends and, and uh, your insights are, are well known and, and respected and, and we're grateful for your sharing them with us today. 
Yeah, thanks, guys. This was really, really good. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, your questions were superb, and, and uh, we appreciate your participation. Mindy, I didn't, did you oh, want more, to? More to come. Um, yes. I guess this is more conversations <laughs> like this. Um, this, will, this will not be the last time. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your thoughtful questions, and, and have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody.